Hello to all of the wonderful boys and girls and gender non-binary friends out there. This is usually the point in Santa's message where he congratulates you all on being so nice. But the truth is, Santa doesn't give a shit anymore. Especially after 2020, who could possibly expect a human being to be nice all of the time, all of this year? Except for sociopaths. And sociopaths don't need toys. I mean, sociopaths treat other human beings as toys. And we know that, don't we? Because we've dated one or three of those in our time, haven't we? Yes, we have. Seriously, Santa is seriously exhausted by people attempting to be nice in the face of this horror show we've all been through this year. If Santa has to walk through and step over one more chalk drawing made by allegedly a child when Santa knows his mother drew it and took pictures of it to put it on her Instagram account just to get likes so she's a perfect mom. I mean, seriously, let your children be sad. They should be sad. This is a horrifically sad time. Get your own late in life identity and stop using and exploiting your children for fake internet points Santa don't like. <laughs> okay. Okay, Santa went to a dark place for a second there, but Santa also regrets nothing because for the rest of you who don't do that horrible shit, uh, you care about one another. You invest in one another's stories. And for that, forever, you shall always earn a place on Santa's good list. Santa thanks you, Santa out. Hello, and thank you for joining So Say We All for its live stream. No, not our OnlyFans urine cam. That's a fundraising avenue for another month, but rather vamp. You all have been so wonderful. You've watched our shows, you've donated, you've performed, you've become members, you've produced showcases, you've coached, and you've mentored other writers. Throughout this year, throughout everything that's happened, you've shown up for us, for the nation, the arts, your communities, and for your fellow human beings. We have brought together some terrific beings tonight to tell stories about what makes them human. DNA literal and metaphorical, the fabric of our genes, the collective subconscious, the people and places that made us, the milky nature chism from which we all spring like melted marshmallow oozing out of a s'more. Mm, it's my favorite. Anyway, nothing's as sweet as our performers. We have for you Tiffany Tang, Leon Duckelbaum, Sunny Ray, Jake Arkey, and Tim West. So get ready, cause here we go. Rudolph, stop licking yourself, please. I need a light over here. All right, hop to it. Ready, here we go. In three, two, one. So say we all. There are 742 Tiffany Tangs on Facebook and 90% of them are high school cheerleaders from Hawaii. I cannot tell you how many times I've had to convince people that my name is actually my name. Tiffany Tang, it's problematic. It's a NASA commercial. It's a Seinfeld episode. It makes people look anywhere in the room but at me when they are searching for the person who belongs to my name. It begs the questions. Is this your stage name? Are you adopted? Is your spouse Chinese? Are you a stripper? Once in third grade, I wrote Tiffany Orange Juice on a math paper just to embrace the funny. It got a laugh. In seventh grade, my student council campaign posters were neon orange with glitter and they read, the astronauts chose Tang, why don't you? I won. 
The story is that my last name is from Norway, <clears throat> from a small town of about 1,200 people called Hofslo, situated in the west between Sognefjord and Lestrefjord. The cornerstone of Hofslo is the land of the Tong family, a wide expanse of farmland funneling down towards a great white house perched on the shore of the Hofslo Lake. This house has stood on this land for centuries, and this house is where my great-grandfather Klaus Tong was born on Christmas Day in 1886. Klaus was one of 18 children and emigrated with his wife Thea to the west coast of the U.S. in the early 1900s, where they had four children. One of their boys, Curtis, my grandfather, grew up in California, as did my father, as did I. Yet these ties remained a mystery to me for most of my life. With divorced parents and a father living in another city who was somewhat estranged from his own father, I was not really privy to many of the oral histories of my family, and much of it was unknown to my father as well. Sometimes over Thanksgiving dinner with my siblings and a smattering of cousins, we would try to piece together the puzzle of our mysterious Norwegian heritage. How many brothers and sisters did our great grandfather have? Where is this Tang farm? Who lives there now? Despite the wide gaps in our collective knowledge, I was always proud that we took fierce ownership of this heritage speaking as if our connection to Norway, however tenuous, made us part of something bigger and more meaningful, this faraway land and this faraway people who share our strange, weird name. Perhaps it is part of being an American, a country where many are without a deep ancestry, and those who do hold stories of their great-great-grandparents tell them with an air of the mythological, these tales of sea voyages from foreign shores that hold our names, our coats of arms, or our highland plaid patterns, and our own endless quests to uncover these bloodlines that bind us to places we have never seen or known for ourselves, but that somehow help us understand who we are. At the time, we never thought the mystery of our heritage would be fully revealed, however, one summer, when I was in San Diego, home from college, it began to unravel itself. My third cousin, once removed, Marta Tang from Norway, took an au pair position in Baltimore for a year and looked up the California Tangs. She found my dad's contact information and made plans to see him in the Bay Area. When Marta arrived at his house, I immediately got a phone call from him. You have to meet her, he said. I'm flying her down to San Diego this weekend. Never having even seen a picture of this woman, I wandered into the San Diego airport baggage claim and glanced around at the bustle of travelers. Marta stepped through the crowd and caught my eye. My height, my hair, my nose. Her piercing blue eyes stared back at my green ones. It's you, we both said as we met and immediately embraced. Because Norwegians learn English basically from birth, Marta and I talked easily and spent the weekend getting to know each other, mostly while standing in line at Disneyland, going to bonfires with my SeaWorld friends, and spending a lot of time at the beach. She was fun and easygoing, and our friendship was immediate. But here's the thing. Marta grew up in Hofslo, in the big white tang house on the edge of the lake. In that moment, she was the owner of my history, of my heritage the answers to my questions. As we spoke about Norway over Chinese food and sunsets at wind and sea, Marta seemed so comfortable on the beaches of San Diego, and I couldn't help but think about quantum physics. Was there an alternate universe out there where my great-grandfather stays in Norway, where one different decision means that I grew up in Hofslo and Marta grows up as a California girl? And why do I feel so connected to this person I've just met and this place I've never visited before? Is genetic memory a thing? The next year, while I was living abroad in England, my father sponsored a spring break trip for me to visit the Norwegian Tangs. That April, a few days before my 21st birthday, I flew into Bergen. Marta met me at the airport with her father, Per, and we drove four hours back to Hofslo. 
Multiple times during this trip, we pulled the car onto a ferry in order to cross the fjord at one point or another. Our travels tipped the mountains where the snow drifts were stacked 10 feet high and then dove into deep valleys where little towns were nestled next to coastlines of sparkling water. I soaked it all in, almost unable to process that Norway was indeed something out of a fairy tale. It was magic and mythology. It was the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. As we approached Hofslo, we passed a sign that read, Tang, two kilometers. We drove down the main street and then turned left onto Tongvein. This road wound through rolling hills to the edge of the lake where that big white house greeted us. I saw it rise up on the horizon and my breath caught. How many of my ancestors, my great grandparents and beyond had traveled this same road, walked up those same stone steps, gazed at the same view of the lake. I was dizzy with the ghosts of the past as we approached this historic home, simply known in the area as Tong, this place and this land that gave me my name. The walls inside were bedecked with old photos and paintings of historic Tangs and uniform and Bunad, the traditional Norwegian attire. There was a map of the land that dated back to the 1850s when our family took possession of the farm. In Norway in the 1800s, it was common to take the name of the farm and abandon your given name. It was my great, great, great grandfather, Per and Christy, who settled the farm with the oldest child inheriting the farm each generation going forward until it now belonged to Marta's dad and would one day belong to Marta's older sister. But it was the day that we visited, visited the churchyard in Hofslo that it became so real to me. The headstones of my ancestors, stark and white against the gray skies, spelled out my history, starting from 1827. Per A. Tang, Christy O. Tang, 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 Tang. Kvel Ifre, rest in peace. I had never experienced my own strange name so embedded in a community, so deeply woven into the fabric of a place. I had never felt my own bloodline stretch so far behind me. Marta's sister Cherste and her brother Torshall also spent the week with us, as well as her mother Bjorg. We explored the town, visited a glacier, and went to a boxing match where I discovered that many Norwegians' English skills improve greatly when mixed with alcohol. Remnants of snow still covered the lake outside of the house, and Marta pointed out the path on the water that was still visible from when the ice was so thick and hard during the winter, cars could drive directly over the lake. One afternoon, we were having coffee on a hillside and Cherste's boyfriend disappeared, only to reappear paragliding over us from the mountaintop. Just a regular afternoon in Norway. One night, Marta and I hung out with her friends, pre-gaming a party with bottles of Blue Nun wine. I ate reindeer for the first time, trying not to think about Rudolph. I watched English football matches in pubs and had a date with a boy from the neighboring town. At the end of the week, I took a large ferry in the early morning hours all the way back down Sagna Fjord to Bergen. The water of the fjord was glassy and smooth, the mountains still snow-capped and overwhelming. How is this place real? I thought to myself. Marta and I kept in touch after that trip. She visited me when I lived in New York. We sent Christmas cards. But even though Norway was now in my heart, I wouldn't return for many, many years. It was after the death of my grandfather in 2018 that my dad and family decided it was finally time to get to know their heritage, and we planned an epic visit. In May of 2019, we traveled to Oslo, where Marta now lives with her husband and kids, and together we celebrated the 17th of May, Norway's big national day of independence and patriotism, when everyone dresses in bunad and flies the Norwegian flag and sings the national anthem and drinks aquavit. It means more to Norwegians than Christmas. That day, in front of the royal palace, I stood with my father, watching the stunning spectacle of children parading through the city behind their school bands playing traditional songs, but also Eye of the Tiger, a sea of red and blue and wondered if he felt the same connection to this place that I had experienced, this feeling of genetic familiarity. 
We spent the day at Marta's house eating traditional foods and cracking open a giant bottle of champagne. The families were together, generational, geographical, connected through distant relatives long gone, but not forgotten. We of course went to Hofslo where Marta's father produced a stack of photo albums with pictures and letters from the past and afternoon coffees in the big white house were equal parts social and historical research on the roots of our family. By a strange turn of events, one of my grad school classmates who is Norwegian had been teaching at a private college in Oslo for the last few years. She had reached out a few months before this trip to let me know she had recommended me for a visiting faculty position. Intrigued, I scheduled an interview with the college while we were in Oslo, and the short story is that I live here now. Marta lives a 15-minute walk up the hill, and we regularly visit all of the Tangs in Hofslo for long weekends. During these visits, I am often greeted by people who have heard of the random American Tang who now lives here in Norway. Oh, it's you, they say to me in Norwegian with a smile to let me know that I belong. Thank you. Guyul from Norway. <laughs> when people ask me if I have siblings, everything is a lie. Sometimes I say that I'm the third of four brothers, which isn't really true anymore. Sometimes I stop myself and I do a quick countdown. I have three, I have two, I have one. I have one brother. Sometimes I say that I just have a younger brother and people comment with, oh, I know how it is being the oldest, but I feel like an imposter afterwards. I feel dirty. I just don't want to turn every conversation into a somber, oh, I'm so sorry for your loss while they search for the next cliche that feels appropriate. Because what do you say? I just don't want to air my baggage to every stranger. But the sibling question comes up regularly and every answer just always feels wrong. And the truth is that I've always been the quintessential middle child. It's my most comfortable skin and I check all the boxes, the creative one, the weird one, the secretly gay one, the awkward one, the vegetarian, the one who followed his own path because nobody noticed. I am the one who moved 1500 miles away and never looked back. And I've spent most of my adult life running away from a family that I never fit into. When I was a kid, I used to sit outside and I'd wait for the aliens to take me back to my real family and away from all these football loving bros. My two oldest brothers turned into such messes and left such a trail of emotional carnage around them that I don't miss them. In fact, it's a relief they're gone and I'm not embarrassed to say that. My mother isn't waiting on a death call or locking her jewelry in a safe. My father isn't chasing my brother down the street in his underwear and risking a heart attack. I don't mourn the things that happen because they happen so gradually and for so long that their lives just seem terminal eventually. Brandy was the first one to go. He was the bad one. He was the black sheep, the manipulator. He lied, he stole, he broke the law. He took up all of my parents' time trying to fix him. He was the other middle child who rose above his status to finally ascend to the problem child. Eventually, when he was at rock bottom, a two-time felon addicted to crack, he ended it. And that was 17 years ago. Rob, the oldest, was a harder story. He was always the good one. He was the one who went to law school and got married and had kids. He was the responsible brother who helped my parents get out of debt, made wise investments, and was a business success. When Randy was living in my parents' house, Rob said that he would never let his children visit as long as my other brother was there, verbally abusing my mother and otherwise putting my parents through hell. My father still wonders how he turned into the very thing he hated. It started with Ambien. I remember visiting him when his son was born, having the most profound conversation of my life with him, and the next day, he swore that we never talked. I knew it was getting progressively worse, and eventually he went to rehab for that and other pills, but it just never seemed insurmountable. Ten years ago, I was Skyping with my parents from India when they mentioned my sister-in-law, who was crying in a fetal position on their couch. This was the first time I realized that the pills were now turning into abuse. 
There were other episodes later on when we were at a restaurant and I had to go get him out of the bathroom because he was asleep standing at a urinal while his children were at the table. My eight-year-old nephew had to hide his keys so he wouldn't drive off in a stupor. He just wasn't a father, a husband, or a son anymore. In spite of his addictions and spiral, Rob was still there, in theory. In sober stints, he was helping my parents with their finances or giving them mortgage advice or legal advice. I don't know anything about mortgages or life insurance, but he did. He was the oldest brother, the adult. And even though he wasn't all there, he was still there in some form. The last few years, he lurched from crisis to crisis. He had just given up. My younger brother would have to break his condo door down to see if he'd overdosed. And he had so many near misses where the ERs derived him just in the nick of time. It was almost like he had a death wish. He'd be discovered unconscious on a park bench. He would leave slurring messages where he passed out mid-sentence through that were four minutes long. He'd wreck his car and I'd pray that one day he wouldn't accidentally plow into a minivan, killing someone. But there was always this false hope that he would somehow get better and he would fix his life. I supported my parents through all this from a distance, every phone call empathetically listening to why did he do this to himself? But I was still half a continent away. When we got off the phone, the problem was distant. When he finally overdosed, doctors said his body looked like that of a lifetime alcoholic. Honestly, it was a matter of time with him. It was a slow suicide. It was always a question of when, not if. We did all the things afterwards, the funeral, the burial, the shiva house. I didn't cry because it was finally over. It was a relief. My parents could finally have some peace. In the weeks that followed, I would space out in the gym between sets thinking, who am I? My best friend and I went to a production of Hello, Dolly, and during intermission, I just started weeping. The finality and weight of everything hit. This was forever. For the rest of my life, I'm the oldest child. It wasn't so much the responsibility, it's the idea that you spend your whole life as someone, and then overnight, it's not you anymore. In every mundane conversation, the usual small talk about birth order and personality would never not be awkward. I still have my younger brother, and he lives near my parents. He's the type who stayed with them by choice until he was 30 because he just wanted to. He's the type who defaulted on his mortgage, credit card debts, and student loans. He's the sort who thought that if his plates were out of state, he wouldn't have to pay the tolls. He means well, but he doesn't handle responsibility at all. We were only 18 months apart, and there has never been a hierarchy because our two brothers were so much older. It's been hard to figure out how I fit into this new role. Last Thanksgiving, I finally forced him to get health insurance, and I put it on my credit card. It's not just not something that he ever thought was important, but I know my mother would spend every cent she had if he needed medical care. I didn't fully embrace my new status until a couple months ago. I was only supposed to visit my parents for three days, but the amount of things that needed to get done snowballed. We had to update the power of attorney forms, the wills, document account numbers. These were all things that we pushed off for two years after my brother passed away. And the more I tried to push them to talk to lawyers and doctors and gave them lists of things to do, the more I realized that they wouldn't get done unless I called, I made appointments, and I set dates. I stayed for 11 days realizing that they couldn't handle their finances on their own anymore. I never asked them about money because it was never any of my business until it finally had to be. It was the first time in 17 years that I'd spent more than three days with my parents, and it just taught me to treasure the fleeting time that we do have together. And now it's time to take care of them. I am not the oldest, and I'll never be the oldest. But when I say it accidentally now, it's just, it's not so foreign. As a middle child, I've never quite known where I fit into the family. And right now, this is just who I need to be. Hello, so say we all, Sunny Ray here. I am so honored to be a part of the last show of the historic 2020. Uh, what a delight it's been to be part of the in-person community, and I'm so proud of you for keeping the virtual community and connection alive during such a difficult and trying time. To everybody watching, I hope you're well, and thank you for sharing space. This poem 
is with the prompt DNA, but with the intention of holding the collective energy of the 12 very long months we've experienced. And it goes like this. Perhaps it was always there. Tip of our nose, pressed under salt crystal skin. Drums blazing through chest, beating out what's left of the year. We are totem poles marching in unison. Figure eights looping and erasing, creating and easing into all that is and all that never got to be. There is a leak in the conversation. There's a dribble that's gone awry, a hole in the misunderstanding, something we've been lacking and a shadow peeking up from the inside. God's like a father away on business, left to our own demise. And what a disastrous place as monsters made bloated bellies with neighbors panhandling out in the streets. We toss bones from our overspilled plates. What's become of us now? Abandoned DNA. We've hollowed out caves in our chests and rearranged the place. Everyone's chattering at the same time. Yeah, everyone's recording and yapping and chattering at the same time. Some stray to the television, others face down in pillow caves. A year of intense slaycation where we tally up the misfortunes like we're watching lottery balls bounce in their cage. Far away, the tide is calling, leaping up and over the horizon, aching to break the hissing spell. She calls to us in waves of fury to recall and awaken the cell. Our cells are not a prison, despite the year that's passed. They're like links left hanging, like a willing hand, ready to grasp out and to love again. Thank you. <clears throat> I always wanted a sibling like the ones I saw on 90s television. Spunky, precocious, a little annoying, but there for you when you needed them the most. Partners until the very end. What I got was my younger brother, Sam. Adopted from Calcutta and dropped into my life after a decade of being the only child in my family. We were, and today in many ways still are, polar opposites. Sam can be wild and reckless, yet undaunted in his pursuit of himself. I, on the other hand, am known for walking the straight and narrow with near Boy Scout diligence, betting that one day I'll be rewarded with fame and fortune for my subdued nature of politely conducting myself. A real George Clooney type is what I'm aiming for. Instead of looking to Sam for solace and understanding after he was assigned the role of my sibling, I only plunged deeper into the world of 90s television. Specifically, I plowed into the cult classic with a dynamo pairing. The X-Files. As a prepubescent creature from the millennial age, I wanted nothing more than to be Agent Mulder. And not just because he and Scully would eventually hook up. No, I wanted a partner to hunt down the existence of the truth, whatever the truth happened to be in my adolescent brain. The only person I seemed able to convince that scary dark forces lurked in the universe was my little brother. As a toddler, I'd make Sam watch episodes of The X-Files to the point where he would run from the room crying in fear. I would try to get him to go into the basement storage closet and turn on the overhead light, which would activate a creepy robotic Big Bird doll with motion sensors drilled into its eyes to mechanically coo, Plutopo. Just like my hero, Agent Mulder, I was kind of a dick. As we grew up, the X-Files and twisted tormenting of my younger brother faded. I got serious about my life, dug my heels into the pursuit of a career in acting. Plays, movies, television shows, 
wherever the spotlight shone was where I wanted to be. This career, I assured myself, would bring fame, notoriety, and financial stability to my life. No more fooling around with childish beliefs. Hollywood, here I come. Sam, however, went the opposite direction, morphing into a full-fledged ghost hunter, like a real bounty hunter of supernatural forces. It's hard to say exactly why my brother chose to commit himself to the never-ending quest of filming a ghostly spirit on camera. After I left for college and moved out of our childhood home to attend film school, Sam would frequently post announcements on Facebook about short horror movies he and his friends were planning to make, though none of them ever saw the light of day. Sam would later go on to graduate high school, get his girlfriend pregnant, and become a father. He then left that girlfriend along with a string of jobs, joined the army, and found a new girlfriend after returning from basic training. She got pregnant, he became a father the second time around, and then 2020 happened. Spooky, no? Yet, as the pandemic raged, my brother, now with buckets of idle time on his hands from being unemployed, started posting online videos with a new group of friends who had formed the coalition Beyond the Grave Paranormal Utah. The Facebook group lists Beyond the Grave Paranormal Utah as a nonprofit, which is accurate considering no money is ever exchanged. Perhaps doing the Lord's work of going out night after night to track down the holy spirits that haunt the beehive state gets you a tax break? From what I can surmise as a viewer, it seems like nothing substantially based in reason ever comes into account when taking a strategic approach to hunting ghosts for Sam. Religion, science, history, and anthropology are all thrown out the window while he points the camera phone, live broadcasting to tens of people, towards his own mouth to shine a green laser inside his cheeks for nearly 15 minutes straight. Surely, this venture was an anomaly in and of itself, right? Okay, fine. Go out once or twice. Say you're tracking down the unexplained phenomena around your neighborhood. I'm sure by next weekend you'll be back to playing video games and eating McDonald's on the couch. Not so. Week after week, Sam is out with his 501c3 crew trying to prove the existence of life beyond the grave. Paranormal. Utah. Checking off all the necessary boxes for a good ghost hunt, the collective has visited a creepy farmhouse, a former asylum, a rundown hotel, and something called the Ted Bundy House, which is a house Ted Bundy never lived in or took any of his victims to, but is open for ghost hunting if you sign up for a time slot one week prior. While the rest of the Beyond the Grave crew seems to be taking these expeditions very seriously, using expensive equipment to analyze and record the escapades, my brother is relegated to the role of cameraman. This, however, does not stop him from providing play-by-play -play commentary as to what's happening or not happening on the live feed, nor does it keep him from yelling at the ghosts, including once forcefully berating a newly found entity to swim Dance. Do something. I live in Los Angeles now, trying to do the thing everyone in LA is doing. Going on auditions for shitty commercials, spending gobs of money on improv classes to list on my resume, and being told over and over that the biz is tricky to navigate, especially now. I have ideas. Hell, I have talent. But no one cares or wants to pay attention to me at the moment. Meanwhile, my brother back in Layton, Utah, is kind of starting to gain a following for these videos. Utah, despite being known for a strict religious landscape dominated by a single monolithic religion, is filled with people who want to believe, just like it says on the poster in Mulder's office. This belief could extend to God, Jesus, or Donald Trump, but it most definitely almost always includes ghosts. Mormons constantly refer to the church's divine trinity as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, priming everyone in the state's borders to at least be on the lookout. As America starts to see more and more deaths over the summer of 2020, 
My brother and his crew claim to see more and more ghosts, growing restless by the monotony of quarantine life. They have so many ghost sightings, in fact, that the group snagged the attention of a local radio show who asked Sam to come on air for an interview. The hosts are straight out of Salt Lake casting. A brash, big talking dude who is married to another meeker guy's sister. Another strange brotherly pairing with only a tenuous link to biology at best. When these guys are not broadcasting, they're out ghost hunting. During the interview, Sam takes us down memory lane of becoming a ghost hunter, recalling how he first believed in ghosts after he witnessed our family dog bark at something one night in the hallway. Sam expresses how it's considered selling out if you get a TV show as a ghost hunter because it becomes all about the ratings. He proudly proclaims that he would never charge anyone a fee for ghost hunting. That's just unethical. What he and Beyond the Grave do is strictly for the love of the game. Sam is gracious enough to say that his girlfriend now turned fiance is the team's case manager, staying at home with their son so everyone else can go hunting. The radio hosts agree. If their wives weren't staying at home with the kids, they couldn't do the work of tracking down ghosts several nights a week. I just hope mine isn't too upset when she finds out how much money I spent on my equipment, my brother jests. Everyone in the studio chuckles in a wholesome, all-knowing fashion. It sounds like they're just trying to convince themselves into keeping this ruse of a hobby alive just a tad bit longer. Several weeks after the radio interview, my brother sends me a text reading, I'm going to have a show on Netflix, Amazon, and the Travel Channel. <laughs> I'm skeptical, but I have to admit my gut reaction. If this is true, I am jealous to my core. I mean, the fuck, that's all it took to get the world to pay attention to you? Instead of jumping to conclusions, I decide to do what Special Agent Dana Scully would do and investigate with logic and reasoning. Turns out Sam has joined a new ghost hunting team out of Reno called the X-Theories, helmed by a giant guy with the ironic name of Tiny. Though my brother has never met Tiny, he's been assured that the X-Theories, which only has four videos posted on their Facebook page, is getting their own show across several streaming platforms. Pressing Sam for details, he seems a bit unsure about all the fine print of the deal. Why would you have a show that's the same on Netflix and Amazon? Aren't they in direct competition with each other? What happened to never doing a television show because it all becomes about the ratings? What about Beyond the Grave? Did you just ditch your friends for the X theories? Didn't you say on the radio show that you'd never charge anyone money for a ghost hunt? I mean, isn't this a lot like selling out? Again, I know, I'm being a dick of an older brother, but I just can't help it. I've gone from an overeager version of Mulder to a fully smug incarnation of Scully, skeptical to the last drop yet loving every sip. But in the same way that Scully had some compassion, I feel it's only right to ask as an older brother if the X Theories 3 production deal is legitimate or if Sam is being used taken too far on a ride by people who dine daily on their own bullshit while promising others a chance to lick the spoon. I don't know. Tiny says we're going to be on the Travel Channel in two weeks, so just watch for it then. Indeed, the x Series does have a poster on their website with the logo of the Travel Channel photoshopped onto it. But the listings on the official Travel Channel website for the date my brother touted to be his big debut doesn't list anything except nine hours of man versus food, which the network runs every day. Following up with Sam, I try to warn him that this all feels a little like a scam. I mean, ghost hunting is one thing, but a multi-development deal straight out the gate is unbelievable and not in a good way. And I should know. I was in a BuzzFeed video once and they almost forgot to put my check in the mail. My brother assures me that this is all real. Not only is the X Theories going to have a TV show in three weeks, but producers have already asked my brother, Tiny, and the rest of the team to write, produce, and star in a movie about Aliens, project currently untitled. While updates on all ventures related to the X Theories are few and far between, Beyond the Grave Paranormal Utah recently posted this to Facebook. Hey, all the Beyond the Grave fans. 
We apologize for no new videos or content. As you all realize, 2020 has been a crazy year, but Utah is under a mandated order, so it's hard to in get investigation. We will be coming up with a few evens soon, so stay tuned. Stay safe. All hashtag ghost hashtag happy hunting. It's disappointing in a very specific way. Sam and I don't share much interests, tastes, or even genes. But right now, we find ourselves on common ground, both chasing the uncapturable. I want to be known as a writer and an actor who changed the face of stage and screen while never losing my artistic integrity. Sam wants to be known as the macho man soldier that can successfully say mission accomplished to all things living and dead. We both want to be known for being the best version of our dream selves, but Neither one of us is really accomplishing their goal right now. Professionally speaking, I'm not really making it the way I thought I would by this point in my life. My agent dropped me without notice. The film I was cast in only shot one day before closing down due to COVID. And while there seemed to be an opportunity to write on a Quibi show, Quibi became Quibi, which is an ancient word for canceled. Honestly, nothing would make me happier if Tinseltown was knocking on my brother's door day and night. At least it would mean one of us made it and could potentially help the other. Still, it's almost uniquely comforting to know that we are indeed partners in our search for trying to discover who we are and our place in the universe. There are no ghosts or monsters other than the people who dangle your dreams in front of you without any promise of them actualizing in reality. My brother and I both want to be seen for who we are and what we have to offer in the world to be known for doing something different that separates us from the pack. We want to believe that others believe in us. I don't care if it's out there. I'm just glad it's the truth. Horace Mann Junior High School doesn't exist anymore. There's a Horace Mann Middle School on the site, still tucked between my elementary and high schools. But all the actual buildings are being reduced to rubble, bulldozed and shoveled, carted and dumped. A $34 million whole site modernization, or WSM. A sign warns visitors about asbestos in the meantime. I visited the old 1955 campus, my alma mater, class of 76, before they tore it down across the two-year demolition, 2017 to 2019, in my job as active teaching artist, I visited regularly, although I hadn't been back in half a century. I was struck by how small it was, of course, how small I must have been, by the old school cells and bells design, the range of numbered rectangles around a rectilinear central quad, the dilapidated structures were not hard to say goodbye to, but I was surprised to discover that they harbored memories which begged a last look at. I checked into Admin, the 100 building, and, still curious after 50 years, ducked into the 200 building, the auditorium and band room. Mr. Bouchard, who taught drama and music, was removed, arrested, tried, and convicted when it was discovered he used those private wood-paneled closet-like rehearsal spaces off the long hallway to molest three minors. They would be my age today, bearing that across their lifetimes, across three lifetimes. I never took drama. I became an actor anyway. The kids do lots of improv now, since nothing written after 1973 can fail to address issues which don't belong in any 12-year-old's curriculum. And kids don't have band anymore. Families can't afford the instruments. I found disturbing photographs of Mr. Bouchard in my annuals, standing with students, his hands always folded in a fig leaf, hovering. Teachers are trying to report things now. The 300 building was my destination. Theater arts. In my day, industrial arts, where kids ages 12 to 15 
who were allowed to operate a platen press as big as a Volkswagen, uh, operate a foundry with a 1,200-degree furnace, operate a high-speed wood lathe. Not to worry. I was warned repeatedly to tuck my long hair into a flimsy hairnet. Mr. Owen demonstrated electrical safety with a pair of purpose-built shocking coils. We kids were all keenly aware of the dangerous environment we were in. Mr. Green, off his med, screamed at me and bounced me from graphic arts class when I was twelve. Counseling office wouldn't admit me without a referral. Mr. Green wouldn't admit me to class without a note from the counseling office. They found me crying outside. I was twelve. Hey, for memories, Classmates.com informs me Mr. Green was only in my 1973 to 1976 annuals. He wasn't there long, no longer than I was. Never showed for photo day. By the time I was 15, metal and wood shops Mr. Taylor was so impressed I didn't just craft hash pipes or come to class stoned like the other chuckleheads. He made me his T.A. He was a good guy, Bob Taylor. Though I'll never forget when some poor kid did cut off his thumb on the bandsaw and his shop shut down, the shop teacher improvised, regaling 29 15-year-old boys with well-worn tales of woodshop mayhem. Kids don't take industrial arts anymore, either, I'm sad to say. Liability issues. Every building I visited was a bad memory I didn't know I harbored. The 400 building, Miss Grotke, who mocked me and changed an apt eighth grader into a kid who hated math. Mr. Nygaard, who was disappointed in the ninth grade math skills he found in a seventh grader who'd been so good at it. The 500 building. Oh, the humanities. Mr. Stewart, freshman composition, the inveterate punster English teacher who connected your face with the name on his roster by attaching nicknames to every pea greener in the seventh grade. She would sing out whenever he saw you on campus. My greeting was, Horace Greeley! Because, you know, go west, young man. Mr. Squire, English teacher, a queer fellow who talked to a skull named Seymour that he displayed on his desk. At the school for decades, I discovered he, too, never showed for photo day. That is Mr. Squire, not, not Seymour. I hesitate to think what Seymour was a memento of. Mr. Sabin, geography teacher, well-traveled, Hawaiian shirts in class, leisure suit for photo day. Only now do I see it. Yeah, total pothead. Mr. Carnes, U.S. history, a lay Methodist minister who made me sit up, no slouching, and insisted on fully sourced papers from 14-year-olds. Miss Hoover, a young divorcee with great legs and short skirts on whom I had a total crush, because she'd grown up in the Bay Area, seeing concerts at the Fillmore, and told me, critiquing my teenage premiere at a play, that uh, <clears throat> your main character is an asshole. My main character was an angry homeless person. 1973. You know, I was too advanced for her. I was 12, she was 22, each of us starting at 7 a.m., Miss Gabay. She went on to become Teacher of the Year in 1991. Everyone I know, everyone I've asked has memories like these. You've got your own gallery like this, don't you? The 700 building at the rear of the campus is the only building that I didn't visit. I avoided. Across the two years, I was admitted back to man as a guest with the freedom of the campus. The 700 building was the gym. And if every building was a memory, gym meant Coach Balicki. The 700 building boys gym and Coach Balicki were both typical of their day. Quintessentially soulless blockhouse. <laughs> Painted that tawny tan-colored enamel that some low-bid contractor settled on as the most cost-effective non-toxic covering for cinder block allowed by law in 1955. The building was at the end of campus. We had to get there, undress, suit up, lock up, assemble on the blacktop by the time the bell rang, navigating the always dank dark locker room 
degrees colder winter or summer than outside with a cement floor too smooth or just a little slimy for sure footing and metal doors that clanged banged rattled tumbling their humid fetid squalid contents into some dirty water puddled on the concrete at our bare feet gym class is the sum of all fears for any adolescent or, or, or was it just me that question itself is the sum of all adolescents like we don't have enough to deal with coming of age grateful for even a modicum of privacy at home i was still adjusting to the varying rates of radical change visited or not yet visited upon my growing body no longer measuring that against a, a father or my one older brother but suddenly subjected to general public humiliation five times weekly stripped of any dignity i had managed to accumulate by the as yet unhirsute age of fifteen and expected to don the most uncomfortable togs i had ever worn in my life uh, we were all supposed to be equalized by our uniform gym wear though in truth enforced uniformity only revealed how much my divorced mother of two for example struggled merely to meet that standard while others still found a way to flaunt a name brand even more daunting i was wearing a jock strap for the first time most boys were suited at least one size too big because we'd all insisted and no mother was going to downsize us right there in the sports clothes department at newberry's and brand name mother please i will not be teased about my jock strap out on the blacktop the last spaces filled the bell rang a whistle shrieked and coach balicki brisk breezily brisked around the corner of the gym wearing white shorts that exposed calf and thigh muscles tan and gnarled like oak with a white usmc t-shirt that looked like it had been painted onto a roman breastplate balicki was a figure of universal awe at man even the other coaches generally lazy fat-ass big beer-bellied boozy looking six-footers in their forties admired balicki who was a bantamweight ex-marine in his sixties could have taken any of them imposing completely cue ball ball with the drill instructor's demeanor and the look of the legendary marine commandant victor krulak even if you don't recognize the name commandant victor krulak gives you a sense of the figure coach balicki cut at my junior high school they didn't even let you take balicki's class until you were in the ninth grade he taught nothing all day but ninth grade physical education and he did nothing all day but run and if you failed balicki's class you didn't go to high school period to pass Bullock's class we all had to run with him he'd take the lead run like a robotic machine perfect motion beautiful really if he didn't expect a general population of teenage boys to dutifully fall in behind him and meet that performance level laps seemingly endless laps behind this maniacal real life colonel steve austin the bionic six million dollar man of the 1970s though <clears throat> as a public school teacher in the 1970s he was more like the $36,000 man, along the dirt perimeter of the rough rectangular track the size of a football field, Coach Balicki trotted at this relentless pace. If we couldn't keep up, we at least had to run the lengths, wind sprints, then we could pant and limp the shorter sides. If Coach and his cohort lapped you, that's all you did all hour, run. Laps all day, ladies, he'd call out. If Coach didn't lap you, you were deemed to earn your right to join in whatever state-approved free play activity was underway for that day. It didn't take long for the boys to divide into two basic groups. The first, the ones who thought of themselves as athletic, who performed to expectation and kept up. Uh, they got to play on the lower field, overlooking the girls' gym, while the rest of us watched running laps on the upper field the rest of the hour. Only these guys got A's and they guarded their click. These three jumped me one day because I bested their boy in sit-ups. The second group, the kids who saw no chance to meet expectations, nor reason to, a motley crew of big fat kids, skinny kids, asthmatic kids, kids with bad hearts, and kids who had got their growth yet, plus kids who were healthy enough in body to run but dismissed the competitive bullshit aspects of the deal. These guys all pulled C's. And Coach didn't care which group you fell in, one way or the other. His work done, he'd saunter off to fill out attendance sheets or two other chores. Grades, when those came. Grades weren't the punishment. The punishment was the humiliation of other kids running by you, lapping you, taunting you, 
flogging the fat kids with their t-shirts. There is a huge measure of unfairness in this, of course. But as a teenager, unfairness is kind of baked in. It's to be expected. At least it was at my school. Where'd you go? And in my family. Yours? Plus, I was a Navy kid myself. Talk about unfairness baked in. And my parents had divorced just a few years earlier. Nobody cared that was unfair. The response to unfairness or being neglected or dismissed is all too often prove your worth to them. Make them see you. So you focus on how to do better. After all, you don't want to get stuck with the fat kids. I am a terrible runner. I have bad arches, legs too slender for my frame or girth, no breath control, all the things that make for poor performance in that particular area. But the same thing that made me the sit-up king of seventh grade may be able to bust through Balicki's arbitrary system of identifying natural athletes. The secret, of course, is not natural or innate or inborn ability. It's all about how provisioned we are, how resilient we are, how ready we are to push past the pain. Like that's new to teenagers. So a few of us whose pride or something wouldn't let us fall behind started running like we meant it, using the cool downs only as much as we needed them, trying not to lag too badly, not rounding the corners, striving to delay Balicki's lapping us. Slowly, we showed progress. A few of us keeping up with each other at first, just for company. Other kids saw what we were doing, figured safety in numbers. Who knows? Surely some will suggest this was Balicki's method all along. Anyway, it worked. The day came when Balicki came up behind us, lapping us so late he slowed to a jog. From behind, he called out some comment about my long hair, but he relented. He slowed up. Comment about my ponytail, the longest in his class, bouncing on my back as I ran. But he didn't lap us. He admitted us to the front runners. And here's what I found out. It wasn't worth it. The kids who finished first were shits. They weren't sterling characters. They were the showboats who had to live up to stricter parental ex expectations of manhood. They spent most of their time arguing over who was going to play quarterback or whatever, far too invested to that to have any fun playing the game, let alone scoping out the girls on the lower field. Those of us who made the cut now <laughs> were amazed to find that it was so meaningless to be allowed to play linebacker to these future frat boys' fantasies of N NFC stardom. The only fun to be had was in the line. Fat kids taking turns dropping their guard while the opposing fat kids rushed and sacked the privileged kids to insist on playing quarterback. The next week, Coach Balicki was doubtless disappointed, perhaps not surprised, to find the laggards lagged behind again. The kids who kept up with him surely felt reassured of their place in the world. The middling varsity career glory days followed by a lifetime of middling success. Good jobs. Good rewards for learning to make the grade early. For keeping up. <sighs> Meanwhile, in their dust, the rest of us. The geeky ones who grew up to be well, actors and playwrights and directors and filmmakers, chemists and electrical engineers, social workers, or... or Happy, well-adjusted workers who don't place their total value as a human being on their commodity value in some competition. We would endure the mutual misery, complain cleverly, share jokes, talk about music and movies and shows and stars we thought were hot, with our little teenage ribcages still heaving from our half-ass windsprints, laughing all the way. While we waited to grow up. I looked it up. Peter Balicki, USMC veteran, public school teacher, retired in 1983 when I was in college at the age I am now. He traveled with his wife, Fran, and their many friends. He passed away in 2017 at the age of 94. Jogging was good for him. But I do wonder how many boys like me have grown old, whose chests will heave at the thought of him and their mention of his name. 
or some other teacher's name. How about you? More middling working class suburb when I was growing up. Now the area around Horace Mann Middle School is a community with more serious challenges from a number of home languages spoken by a large refugee population to the real and apparent evidence of children badly in need of resources and attention. They have much better teachers. I am so happy to assure you, loving and caring, listening and nurturing. They import the crazy people now as, as teaching artists. Yet, even though the kids have better care, they have bigger problems. I'm sorry that I don't have a happy ending. We're still failing our kids. But I walked out past the dirt track at Man at the back of campus every chance I got when another route would have done. I thought to walk along the dirt track just a few paces, a few times. No wind sprints, just strolling. I noticed at the back of the campus the one thing not to be torn down that won't disappear and remain only as a painful memory has altered. For the better, and forever I trust. When the bell rings, the broad field of dirt swells with kids on their way home ducking out the back of campus, the back gate, the same way I always went out past what used to be the coach's private parking where they stuck the kids with special needs in bungalows in my day. A stream of kids of all sizes and shapes and colorings, natural and artificial, a glorious river of identities, all of whom would have been oddball kids when I was a teen. Kids with purple hair, girls with goth makeup and leather jackets, boys with earrings and scars, refugee kids, gabbing away in a dozen languages. And no, I'm typing or labeling them like my generation here. I'm trying to say it's glorious because it has changed, because it isn't a cohort regimented, keeping up with some insane outmoded manner of living from the past. It's like a caravan, a vast caravan of promise, of young people who, though no longer content to pipe down and bring up the rear, will never again be whipped into running. That, my friends, brings us to the end of the December Vamp 2020 Showcase DNA. Now, we have a ritual at So Say We All. It's very important to us. Where we honor everybody we've had the privilege of working with, and especially those that we've lost along the way. And we do this by singing a song. Nobody wants to hear me sing this song, but um, we find amazing artists generally to do it for us. It's been very difficult during the COVID times, as you can imagine, but we're very lucky that in our undisclosed Eastern Counties location, besides Lana, uh, we have some wonderful singers in our community. The song is older than Auld Lang Syne. It's Irish. There's many communities that have the capacity and history of mixing melancholy and humor, but the Irish is kind of what we know and what we have to work with. And cats. <laughs> so without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the Hatch Family Band. Please meet Blair, Morgan, and Grace. Shunt. Okay. Of all the money that here I spent, I spent it in good company. And all the harm. There I've done. 
begun Alas, it was to none but me For all I've done For want of wit To memory now I can't recall So fill to me the parting glass Good night and joy be with you all And all the comrades that e'er I have had They're sorry for my gone away And all the sweethearts that e'er I've loved They'd wish me one more day to stay But as it falls unto my lot That I should go and Softly call Good night and joy be with you all I'll gently rise and softly call Good night and joy be with you all Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. That's it right there. I think that's the one. That, friends, is our 2020 Vamp Storytelling Showcase DNA. Thank you so much for surviving with us. My God, we made it, but I guess it's not over yet. So hang in there. At least we'll get more stories. I hope we get to hear them from you very soon. If you want to submit your story, please visit our website at sosayweallonline.com and look for the submit link. All of 2021's themes are online on our website right now, so check them out. Also, know that So Say We All, along with every other arts organization in the country and the world probably, is going to get rocked by the pandemic. So please, if you have it in you, donate to us or become a member. Again, go to sosayweallonline.com and look for the donate link. Thanks so much. We love you so much, and we're so grateful you're surviving with us. Can't wait to see a hopefully much better year in the future. Good night. Good Happy luck. Happy holidays. <laughs>